This is a rare opportunity for me. I usually get about once a year to speak to the Ironmen, so I'm glad to be with you uh, this Wednesday. Uh, thanks for, to Jeff for sharing his testimony, and thanks to Hans as well uh, for what they had to say. I'm uh, privileged to get to follow after men like that that I've known for some time. And uh, I am just uh, wanted to reflect a little bit myself on uh, this summer. I passed 15 years of being on staff here at Grace Chapel. Wow. And uh, yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> after, <laughs> thanks. After what Jeff says, you might wonder, well, what's wrong with me? Why haven't they sent me someplace else, right? They send everybody else other places. I don't know. I haven't figured that out yet. <laughs> but as I was reflecting on that 15 years, it goes by, as you know, really fast. That's what everybody always says at anniversaries, but it does go by fast. But it gave me an opportunity to reflect on uh, relationships with people that I've had, uh, even as I look around this room this morning and think about uh, people that I've known for a long time, uh, Dwayne for 15 years, others of you for that amount as well. Some maybe just a short time, or we've had just brief interactions along the way. Uh, some that I've got a chance to go to Israel with, whose faces I see even now. Some who are going with me in a few weeks uh, to Israel again. Can't wait to share that time with you. That's one of the greatest privileges of my life, to get to share those kinds of times with people uh, from our church. And uh, reflected even, as I was thinking, Jeff, that you would be up here. <laughs> of that time, we played Frisbee golf up there at Hume Lake, uh, one that you will remember and remind me of quite a bit. Uh, Jeff accused me of attacking him with a tree. He tripped over a, a tree stump as he was going to pick up a, a Frisbee. He thought that I had somehow planted that tree stump and blamed me for the scar that's on his leg. I think you still have a scar from that, Jeff, that you show me regularly. So, okay, so... Uh, the blood and the tears uh, that we shared around a Frisbee golf course at, uh, at Hume Lake is something that I'll always remember. Uh, since Hans was up here too, uh, something I'll always remember about Hans is he was not dressed appropriately when we went up on the, um, on the Temple Mount uh, one time. And so if, you're, if you come dressed immodestly, as they define it there, they are um, happy to give you something to wear to cover up. And what it is is this skirt that actually comes all the way down to the ankles. And it's, it's a very narrow skirt. And they made, well, Pastor CJ and, Pastor, and Hans and, some, and Rich as well. I have a picture of it. I didn't bring my picture with, you, with me today. But I have a picture of these three guys in these really long, ugly skirts up on the Temple Mount because they, uh, they forced them to wear them up there. So if you go to the Temple Mount with me, make sure you wear long enough pants so you don't have to wear a skirt for a half hour up there. But that's a great memory that I share with Hans as well, but as a pastor, again, I've, had, I've been with some of you in some of those really joyous moments in your life, maybe at your wedding, uh, maybe at the birth of a child, maybe at your retirement ceremony. Bart, I was there for that with you, um, and I remember that vividly as I think about it now. Uh, and also sometimes with very difficult times in life too, the death of a loved one, um, and, and other times like that too. Um, so there are ups and downs uh, in, in the life of, and ministry that we share with one another. Uh, but those long-term relationships is one of the reasons that I love to be a pastor at a church like this. Um, and, and I never know sometimes if I pick up the phone, if the conversation that I'm going to have is a five-minute conversation or a 30-year conversation with somebody, right? If this is going to be the beginning of a relationship that will last for a lifetime. Um, there have been many because of the place where we live. Um, we've had... Uh, people come and go because of their jobs. Um, I've had many uh, pilots, test pilots, who've come through my small group. They're often here for a couple, three years, and they often dive in really quickly and get to have great relationships. And I've got friends who are now all, all over the world in different places because they spent some time here at Grace Chapel. Um, I've got other friends who are on staff here for many years, pe people like Danny uh, Gardner, uh, who I speak with regularly, Dean Spolstra, Jeremy Hartley, of course. Uh, Andy Rollins, Michael Davis were some of those who passed through my small group who went on to other places after they retired from the Air Force. And as I think about that, there are major characters in our life, right? People that we see for long periods of time. And then there are sometimes those minor characters that kind of come and go as well. Today I get to talk with you about Esau, who is a minor character uh, in Scripture, right? He's actually what is called a foil. In scripture, he's a, an opposite of another character, Jacob, right? Anybody in here have the name Esau, by the way? No, we don't, we don't tend to name our kids after Esau that often, do we? But Jacob, there are Jacobs around. You probably know some Jacobs. Uh, maybe there are Jacobs in the room. Maybe Jacob is a part of your name or your, your family's names. And so a, a huge contrast, even when we think about these two characters, I think Jer Jacob was covered last year as you were going through the major characters, and, uh, and Esau was assigned to me by Weston for our time together today. And I, I want to talk, talk with you a little bit about this character of Esau from Scripture. In your notes at the beginning there, I have this definition for what is a foil, and that's what, something we're going to be talking about here a bit. It's, it's a literary device, really, this foil, and I've got a definition there for you. A character that acts as a contrast to the main character. 
Often that character helps us to see what would have happened if the main character took a different path, right? A foil, so is a character whose function is to show what would have happened if the other path was taken. A really good example of this uh, is actually Abraham and Lot. And this is the story we find in, earlier in Genesis, in Genesis chapter 13. And I'm just going to read this section for you here. If you want to follow along with me, you can go to Genesis 13. I'm going to begin in verse 2. But I want to illustrate this idea of what a foil is by looking at Abraham and Lot. This is actually before Abraham was Abraham. He was Abram at this point. Genesis 13, beginning in verse 2. Now Abram was very rich in livestock, in silver and in gold. And he journeyed on from the Negev as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai. For some of you, that's setting off bills in your head. You're thinking of that place right now. To the place where he had made an altar at the first. And there Abram called upon the name of the Lord. And Lot, who went with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents, so that they could not support, so that the land could not support both of them dwelling together. For the possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. That's a terrible problem to have, right? I have too much stuff. I can't even dwell with my relative here. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abraham's, of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of, lives, of Lot's livestock. Excuse me. At that time, the Canaanites and the Perizzites were dwelling in the land. Then Abram said to Lot, let there be no strife between you and me and between your herdsmen and my herdsmen, for we are kinsmen. Is not the whole land before you? Separate yourself from me. If you take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if you take the right hand, then I will go to the left. So here, you guys, literally, one takes the road to the left, the other takes the road to the right, and we as an audience get to observe the consequences of that decision, of that choice for both of the characters. I thought it was interesting that we started today with that question about favorite sports teams. <laughs> and if we're talking about rivalry between Esau and Jacob, uh, there were people at our table who were Big Ten fans, right? And one was for Alabama, one was from Georgia. They're playing each other this week. Uh, somebody else said that they were, um, who was it, um, uh, a uh, Buccaneers fan. And the Buccaneers are playing my Broncos this week. So I'm glad we didn't have any fights in the room uh, this week. I, I don't ex have expectations that my Broncos can beat your Buccaneers, by the way, in this week. But... <laughs> And then you had David start off with talking about being a Yankees fan for the evil empire for the East, talking about the Dodgers as the evil empire for the West, and with me as a Cubs fan, the good guys in the middle there a little bit, all with blue, but again, we know the right color of blue uh, in there is cubby blue as well. So, so there's that rivalry that comes up over these silly things, right? But then Robert, I think, made a really good point at our table by saying, you know, when I became a Christian, those things faded in importance. They're not nearly as important to me. My, my teams aren't nearly as important to me. I just don't have the taste for them that I once did because my primary allegiance, as it always will be, is to Christ, right? And so it turns our attention from those minor things to the major things. There's nothing wrong with enjoying your sports teams, but they should pale in comparison to your love for Christ and for your love for your brothers. And, and Robert expressed that around our table this morning. I appreciate that. We are on Team Jesus, as Mike said as well. And that is what unites us. That's what brings us together. And, and I love that. And I love seeing you guys around tables and having that great discussion. And again, seeing your faces all, uh, all together in unity around that major thing. Okay. So, th but this, again, what is a, a foil here? We've got Abraham going to the right, uh, Lot going to the left. And we see the consequences from those two things. Abraham is blessed by God. Lot has to be rescued by Abraham a little bit later on and finds himself in Sodom and Gomorrah, literally, literally living in those places. Okay, so blessing versus cursing happens because of a choice. In the New Testament, we also have Judas as a foil to the rest of the apostles. Okay? Judas is a minor character as in terms of what we understand from the apostles in the New Testament, but we know very clearly what kind of person he represents. And we also know the opposite of who Judas is because we have Peter. Right? Think about Peter's story. In fact, even just the space of one day where Peter denies Jesus three times, Judas also in that day betrays Jesus, and yet Peter lives while Judas does not, right? Peter comes to a place of repentance. Jesus restores him, and Judas kills himself and, and forfeits any chance at repentance and restoration. Foils, right? Judas is a foil to Peter, and we get to see much more of Peter's life later on after he is restored. He becomes a pillar of the church. He writes letters of scripture for us, and we know him well as a character of scripture. Judas completely disappears. Again, people don't name their kids Judas. They do name their kids Peter, right? 
So it's important for us to see these foils and understand their function. And as we come to one today with Esau, he's going to be a foil to Jacob. Let's get into his story here. Uh, there's not a lot of information about Esau in Scripture, but he is uh, a character that comes and goes through the end of Genesis, beginning in chapter 25. And, and here I'm going to set the stage for you a little bit. A couple of generations after Abraham in the story of Genesis, we come to another set of characters, and that is Jacob and Esau. These are the grandsons of Abraham, the sons of Isaac. So uh, we're going to head to chapter, we're on our way to chapter 2015. So we're, oh, sorry, 25. We're headed there right now. So Jacob will function as the main character in this section, whereas Esau is that minor foil character. But when I think about Jacob, <laughs> this is not the kind of person that we would like to be around anyway, right? Jacob is no superhero in scripture. He's actually a very sorry excuse for a hero in the Genesis narrative. In fact, Jacob is a foil for God in a lot of ways. Who is the hero in Jacob's story? It's God, right? God is the one who encounters him and turns him from somebody despicable into somebody who is going to inherit the promises that God has for his people. Jacob in the story of Genesis 25 through 29 is a deceiver, a usurper, a cheater. This is not the kind of person you want to hang out with. Esau, if I'm being honest, seems more like a hapless bumbler than an evil person in the story. Uh, to be sure, he makes a couple of huge mistakes, right? However, one of them is clearly in a moment of thoughtless desperation. He thinks he's about to die, and he, um, he, he says, what is to me my birthright if I'm about to die, right? Give me some food, otherwise nothing means anything to me. Uh, so the other one is, is really a trick that's played on him by his brother and his mother, of all people, in this narrative. So I'm not making excuses for Esau. It is really what becomes of him because of what happens because of his mistakes that is the issue for him. However, I think the text makes it clear that neither Jacob or Esau is a particularly appealing person. It's not like we have a superhero and a sidekick here, right? Neither is particularly someone you would want to root for or even wish to be around. Like if I was offered a friendship with Jacob in, the first, uh, in that time of history, I think I'd probably pass on being around Jacob much. Who knows when he's going to trick or deceive you or steal from you. This is one of the aspects, though, of Scripture that makes it so powerful and so wonderful for me, right? It gives us real characters. Imagine if Scripture only described people who were perfect from beginning to end. You, you might look at it and you say, oh, that's an interesting story, but I'm not like that. That doesn't look like the world around me. So what does that have to do with me, right? But scripture gives us people who are like us. Now, not in every aspect. We don't live the kind of life that Jacob and Esau lived or that Abraham did or Moses did or even Peter or Paul, right? We live very different lives than they did. But we can see in them people who are like us anyway. They act like we do. They make mistakes like we do. They need redemption like we do, right? And, and so it gives us relatable people to um, come into contact with in Scripture. And this is one of the things that I love about Scripture. And one of the things to me that shows me that this is the word of God, not the word of man. Because man tends to write stories that whitewash all of the flaws, right? If you go to other ancient religions, uh, and you, even, even in ancient history, if you go to places like Egypt and Assyria, what you find is that if, if, if there are any mistakes, they either don't get recorded or they get erased by the next generation. But scripture gives us the mistakes and problems and warts of all of its characters all the way through. We have very few characters in scripture that we know anything about that are perfect people. And to me, that is tremendously reassuring and comforting because they're people like us, right? They're in people in need like us. And to me, that shows uh, how relatable scripture is. I am a real per person. I'm flawed. I'm sinful. I'm shockingly stupid at times. I'm very ordinary, right? I know it's shocking, you can't hardly believe that, but it's true. <laughs> My life demonstrates the same kind of need for redemption that Jacob and Esau had. So let's turn our attention to Genesis chapter 25, beginning in verse 19. I'm going to start to read uh, this section of scripture for you. Um, I think I have a blank for you in your notes, and I want to cover that before I, I read this section. So Esau is not the main character in his own life. He's a foil. Foil is F-O-I-L. But you could just as easily put in F-O-O-L, right? Yeah. Foil and fool, in this case, are interchangeable. So let's go to Genesis 25, 19. It starts with this. These are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham fathered Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Padanaram, 
the sister of Laban the Aramean, to be his wife. And Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his prayer, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. The children struggled together within her, and, and she said, If it is thus, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord, which is one thing she gets right in this passage. I just want to highlight that. She went to inquire of the Lord, right? Oftentimes, you guys, when we face something that we don't understand, we spend our time talking with everybody else around us, looking for their advice or what would they do or complaining to them about what God has given to us. What I, what I like about um, Rebecca's response here, she goes directly to the Lord, immediately appears, and she takes her problem to him. You guys, I think oftentimes we think God can't handle our problems, right? Or, or God doesn't know that we are flawed and uh, people of little faith or doubting. But God knows who you are inside and out, right? You're not going to surprise him by going to him with your anger, your disappointment, your doubts, your struggles. God knows all that about you. You can't hide it anyway. Might as well take it to him. And that's what I love about what she does here at this point. She doesn't get everything right, though, in this passage. I want to make that clear. So uh, keep going here. So she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The older shall serve the younger. Now I want you to notice this is a pattern that's been repeated already in Scripture. Remember, Isaac himself had a rival in his half-brother of Ishmael, right? Are we still dealing with the consequences of that down today? Right? Yeah. Israel and the Arabs come from Isaac and Ishmael. Okay? And so there are two nations. So Isaac had some experience with this idea of two nations struggling against one another. Right? Now, it's going to be repeated in the next generation, where Jacob and Esau, who will be then later become Israel and Edom, struggle against one another. Edom will eventually produce Herod the Great. He's going to be the last really well-known Idumean um, from Edom. Herod the Great, who, of course, has interaction with Jesus and tries to kill Jesus when Jesus is first born. So you see a rivalry that continues, nations that struggle against each other for literally thousands of years after these births. Um, begins here, a sibling rivalry, right? Man, I have four boys in my house, you guys. Um, so the first two are two and a half years apart. So they're fairly close in age. And then there's a four-year gap. And then we have two who are exactly, almost exactly two years apart. Uh, the first two didn't have much of a rivalry, if I'm being honest. But the last two have nothing but rivalry. <laughs> they play together on a tennis team up at Quartz Hill. Uh, and last night, they were out playing each other on the tennis court. And I always know when they come home exactly what the first thing that's, that I'm going to hear is going to be. I beat him, right? I don't always know which one is going to say that, but I always feel like saying to them, who cares? <laughs> like, this isn't, uh, this isn't Alabama, Georgia, right? <laughs> this is Matthew and Jonathan, right? Nobody's going to remember the score of this game. Nobody even witnessed this game to, to know the score of it. And yet it's such a big deal to them, right? They won't talk to each other for hours, maybe even days afterwards. Uh, so that's the kind of thing. It blows up these little small things into sibling rivalries that come down for generations and ages. You guys, they, I'm not always sure. Certainly with the Hatfields and the McCoys, right? Sorry, David, I'm bringing up the Hatfields and the McCoys. Yeah, do you know any Hatfields that you really hate? This is the only thing. If you spell McCoy wrong, it's capital C. OK. Then you've got the wrong one. OK, OK, I got you, I got you. So, but these things get handed down. Nobody even knows why they were fighting originally about these things. There's just such a tradition to those rivalries that they get blown out of proportion here. So again, back to this. I want to tell you that Jacob and Esau lived 2,000 years before Christ. They were as far away from Jesus in time as we are from Jesus in time. All right? That's 4,000 years worth of rivalry that comes up out of that. And from what we can tell, they were semi-nomadic. This means that they lived uh, kind of in the land, and they moved from place to place. They didn't really live in cities, okay? Semi-nomadic lifestyle means that they're traveling with their flocks and herds. You guys, it was intense. All right, nobody got that joke. So, <laughs> all right, I know it's a bad joke, but I'm going to actually dub double down on it here for just a minute. Okay, I have a joke. A jo <laughs> yeah, all right. I'll help you to understand that first one, all right? So here's a joke for you. A man is having trouble sleeping. He goes to see his doctor, and the doctor says, how can I help you? The man says, I keep having two recurring dreams. They kind of alternate, right? In one, I'm a wigwam. In the other one, I'm a teepee. One's, one time, I'm, I'm a wigwam. One time, I'm a teepee. And these keep going back and forth. The doctor says to him, you're too tense. <laughs> 
right. So some of you still don't get that, right? Ten, all right. Yeah, bad jokes. Hey, hey, your groans just let me know that you're still awake. So I'm, I'm glad to, I'm glad for all of that. All right, that's a lot of work for some, some jokes there. All right, so Jacob and es Esau, they're twins who are born, born moments apart, right? This is part of what I would call the unlucky, if there's such a thing as luck in life, of Esau. Though he is born first by seconds, right? Jacob is already trying to steal the spotlight by clinging to his heel. So he's got somebody literally right on his heels. Um, and this is the beginning of Jacob's life and something that will come to define him, uh, Esau's life really, and something that will com come to define him through his life. And it's the beginning of a pattern where the firstborn is somehow usurped from his position. We'll find this later with, uh, with Joseph, right? He's the lastborn of his father's sons, and yet he rises to the top. David also will come from the bottom up to the top in his, um, in his uh, family in order to become king. And it becomes this interesting um, kind of tension within scripture between the immense privilege and honor of being firstborn, Christ after all is the firstborn, right? And all the things that come with that in so many ways, there's a privilege and honor and respect and position that comes, the, the be, that comes with being the firstborn. But also God's love for and mighty use of the unexpected underdog as well. It's a big, um, ten, uh, big theme within scripture. The tragedy of this situation, however, is in that last verse. Look at that last verse again, verse 29. What does it say? It says, Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. What's wrong with that? Everything's wrong with that, right? Why does Jacob love, uh, or why is, um, sorry, why does Isaac love Jacob? Because of what he gets from him, right? I love my son because he prepares food for me. That's a terrible thing to say uh, about him, right? That's the reason for my love for him. But then even worse, but Rebecca loved Jacob. As if not both of them love Jacob, but right, Isaac loves one and Rebecca loves the other one. Does that produce a very unhealthy relationship within that house, right? You guys think about even in your own parenting, is it possible that one of you has a favorite and the other one has another favorite within your kids? What might that produce in them? Bitterness, rivalry, um, insecurity? Maybe you would come from a family like that too, where you maybe knew that your parents had another favorite and you were not that favorite. Or, or maybe it's the opposite. You knew that you were the favorite and you took that to advantage maybe over your siblings as well. You guys, that is not a healthy relationship at all. And it's the beginning of a, a very difficult life for both Jacob and Esau. But Rebekah loved Jacob. That's a terrible reflection on Isaac and Rebekah. And it seems to be the beginning of a terrible consequence for their kids. So that's the bad beginning, if you want to look at it that way. Episode two, then, comes a little bit later, just uh, the next paragraph, actually. And this is the despised birthright. Uh, Genesis 25, verses 29 to 34. And here I would say, it is one thing to make a terrible mistake. It is another to let that mistake define you. And that's the blank that you have there in your notes. It's another to let that mistake define you. Verse 29 of Genesis 25. Here's the next episode of Jacob and Esau. Once when Jacob was cooking stew, Esau came in from the field and he was exhausted. And Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stew for I am exhausted. Therefore, his name was called Edom. Edom comes from red, it's around that red stew. Verse 31, Jacob said, sell me your birthright now. Esau said, Esau said, I'm about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? Jacob said, swear to me now. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Then Esau despised his birthright. Now, this can be a little bit of a confusing thing here. And especially, I think, the choice of that word, Esau despised his birthright. What does that mean? Well, I think it means, and there's commentators go back and forth different directions with this. But I think that, that then Esau despised his birthright it means that over time, Esau saw the mistake that he had made, and he allowed it to become a bitter root that grew up within him. That this is something that he looked back all the time on, and he said, I can't believe what happened there, right? I can't believe that I made that mistake, and I can't believe that my brother allowed me to make that mistake, and that this is my, the consequence of that mistake going forward from there. And so this actually starts to eat up and define Esau. This is what his life from that point forward is all about. Now, should Esau have... Um, 
uh, cherish that birthright much better? Absolutely. This is a promise. In fact, this birthright is a promise that goes all the way back to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3, the Abrahamic covenant, where God promised Abraham three things, a land, a nation, and a blessing. That promise then is handed down from generation to generation to generation after that. And Jacob is going to, or Esau is the one who's supposed to inherit that, uh, that covenant. And it's a big thing. It's God's relationship with people. This is how God is going to bless all the nations on earth. It's maybe the biggest promise ever made in scripture. And Esau is the heir apparent to that, and he gives it away. He despises it. He doesn't understand the depth of it, and he gives it away. And so it's a tragic thing that he does that. But like I said, I think the key here is that despising of it later. He allows this thing to eat him up for uh, all time going forward. And how do we know that? Look at Hebrews chapter 12. The New Testament also brings up Esau, and it's not a pretty picture. I think I printed it for you in your notes, but you can look at it in your Bibles as well. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 15 to 17. Do you ever wish that your name was mentioned in Scripture? <laughs> Depends, right? <laughs> On what comes before and after uh, what is mentioned there, right? There are some places where you hear a testimony given about somebody in Scripture and you think, wow, I would love to have that on my tombstone, right? This section of Hebrews 12, I'm guaranteeing you, Esau does not want to hear his name mentioned in this context. This is what it says, Hebrews 12, verses 15 to 17. See to it that no one fall, fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled, that no one is sexually immoral or unholy, like Esau. Okay, can you think of a more devastating thing to be said? Unholy like Esau. I always think about Jeroboam, the first king of the northern kingdom of Israel. After the first time he's mentioned, almost every other time he's mentioned as Jeroboam who caused Israel to sin. And this comes up over and over and over again in First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. How would you like it if every time your name was mentioned from the pulpit by Chris, <laughs> he said something like, who caused Israel to sin, right? And that was almost obligated that that would be your nickname, right? Not, not Brad who caused the scar on Jeff's leg, right? But Jeroboam who caused Israel to sin. This is how he is known after that. But look at this, what it says further. For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. He's looking for that moment of repentance. But I think it's, he comes to exactly that same spot where Judas does, right? That it, before he can repent, time is up for him. What's the issue for him? It's that root of bitterness. He despised his birthright. He despised the fact that he had made a mistake in the past. He's no longer able to get past that, and it causes him to have a root of bitterness that then causes him to be unholy, to turn away from God. And that brings us to the last and more, even more, more tragic part of the story. This is Genesis 27, 1 to 45. I see that I'm close to out of time, but I'm going to read this section for us anyway. And it's a longer section, so hang in there as we read it. But it's worth reading, you guys because it's God's inspired word to us, right? Anything that I might say pales in comparison to what God's word says. It's the inspired word of God. Let's get to it. In Genesis chapter 27, verse one. When Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, he called Esau, his older son, and said to him, my son, and he answered, here I am. He said, behold, I am old. I do not know the day of my death. Now then, take your weapons, your quiver and your bow, and go out to the field and hunt game for me and prepare, me for, uh, prepare for me delicious food such as I love, and bring it to me so that I may eat, that my soul may bless you before I die. Now Rebekah was listening when Isaac spoke to his son Esau. So when Esau went to the field to hunt for game and bring it, Rebekah said to her son Jacob, I heard your father speak to your brother Esau. Bring me game and prepare for me delicious food that I might eat it and bless you before the Lord be before I die. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice as I command you. Go to the flock and bring me two good young goats so that I may prepare for them, from them delicious food for your father, such as he loves. And you shall bring it to your father to eat so that he may bless you before he dies. But Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, Behold, my brother Esau is a hairy man, and I'm a smooth man. Perhaps my father will feel me, and I shall seem to be mocking him and bring a curse upon myself and not a blessing. His mother said to him, Let your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice and go, bring them to me. So this shows that even late in life, right? There's a difference between how Rebekah and Isaac view their sons. Verse 14. 
So he went and took them and brought them to his mother. And his mother prepared delicious food, such as his father loved. Then Rebekah took the best garments of Esau, her older son, which were uh, with her in her house, and put them on Jacob, her younger son. And the skins of the young goat she put on, her hands, on his hands and on the smooth part of his neck. And she put the delicious food and the bread, which she had prepared, into the hand of her son Jacob. So he went into his father and said, My father. And he said, Here I am. Who are you, my son? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. Still the defe- deceiver, right? I have done as you told me. Now sit up and eat of my game, that your soul may bless me. But Isaac said to his son, How is it that you have found it so quickly, my son? He answered, Because the Lord your God granted me success. And you know, see what he says about the Lord your God? I find that disturbing as well, right? Is the Lord the, the Lord of our fathers and not of us? Does the Lord have grandchildren? Of course not. He has direct relationship with each one of us. I find it disturbing that he would say something like that, okay? Um, uh, where was I? Verse, I'm sorry. Verse 21. Then Isaac said to Jacob, Please come near that I may feel you, my son, to know whether you are really my son Esau or not. So Jacob went near to, Esau, to Isaac, his father, who felt him and said, The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands. So he blessed him. He said, are you really my son Esau? He answered, I am. Then he said, bring it near to me that I may eat of my son's game and bless you. So he brought it near to him and he ate and he brought him wine and he drank. Then his father Isaac said to him, come near and kiss me, my son. So he came near and kissed him. And Isaac smelled the smell of the garment and blessed him and said, see the smell of my son is as the field of a smell of a field that the Lord has blessed. May God give you of the dew of heaven and of the fatness of the earth and plenty of grain and wine. Let people serve you and nations bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers and may your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you and blessed be everyone who blesses you. As soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, when Jacob had scarcely gone out from the presence of of Isaac, his father, Esau, his brother, came in from his hunting. He also prepared delicious food and brought it to his father. And he said to his father, let my father arise and eat of his son's game that you may bless me. His father Isaac said to him, who are you? He answered, I am your son, your firstborn, Esau. Then Isaac trembled very violently and said, who was it that then that hunted game and brought it to me? And I ate it all before you came and I have blessed him. Yes, and he shall be blessed. As soon as Esau heard the words of his father, he cried out with an exceedingly great and bitter cry and said to his father, bless me, even me also, O my father. But he said, your brother came deceitfully. He has taken away your blessing. Esau said, is he not rightly named Jacob? For he has cheated me these two times. He took away my birthright, and behold, now he has taken away my blessing. Then he said, Have you not reserved a blessing for me? Isaac answered and said to Esau, Behold, I have made him lord over you, and all his brothers I have given to him for servants. And with grain and wine I have sustained him. What then can I do for you, my son? Esau said to his father, Have you but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, O father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. Then Isaac, his father, answered and said to him, Behold, away from the fatness of the earth shall be your dwelling, and away from the dew of heaven on high. By your sword you shall live, and you shall serve your brother. But when you grow restless, you shall break his yoke from your neck. Now Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father had blessed him. And Esau said to himself, The days of mourning for my father are approaching. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. But the words of Esau, her older son, were told to Rebekah. So she sent and called Jacob, her younger son, and said to him, Behold, your brother Esau comforts himself about you by planning to kill you. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice. Arise, flee to Laban, my brother in Haran, and stay with him a while until your brother's fury turns away, until your brother's anger turns away from you and he forgets what you have done to him. Then I will send and bring you from there. Why should I be bereft of you both? in one day. Now, there's another big episode in Jacob and Esau's life, but we don't have time for that today. Uh, But in that episode, it actually shows Esau having mercy on Jacob. So there is a measure of repentance, I think, in Esau's life. He doesn't kill his brother, even though he has opportunity to do so. And yet, the ultimate evaluation of his life, you guys, comes from the bitterness that comes from him giving away his birthright and being tricked out of his blessing. So I have a few things for application for you. First of all, here, three things on, in your notes. Again, some blanks for you there. The first application I would give to you is help your kids to be better, right? Again, we saw that Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. 
Now, it's interesting because Isaac and Rebekah had been in that same position, both themselves. They had been without children themselves. They had cried out to the Lord and asked for the promises to be given to them. Why didn't they learn from that and pass those things down to their sons instead? So help your kids to be better. Learn from your own experience. You guys, oftentimes we think, I can't tell my kids of all the things that happened to me because they would see me as a hypocrite, right? That I'm different now than I was then. But you guys, that's the pattern of scripture. David tells Solomon to be better than him, right? Follow after the Lord wholeheartedly. Solomon, of course, knows the consequences of David's personal sin with Bathsheba and the murder that happens even because of that. Solomon knows all of that about his father. And yet Solomon would be cheated out of the blessing of knowing about God if David didn't tell him all that had happened to him in his life as well. You don't have to have a perfect example to show to your kids. You just have to have a redemptive example to show to your kids. Look at who I was and what God made out of that, right? That is what they need to see from you. They don't need to see perfection. They need to see the redemption that God brought through that for you. So help your kids to be better. The second one, don't be uh, either a fool or a foil. You can decide what you put in that uh, list there, right? Don't be a fool or don't be a foil. Second mm. Corinthians 5.17 says this, Therefore, if any was, anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. That is the testimony of what Jesus can do with something that is broken. He can turn it around. There doesn't have to be that root of bitterness. You don't have to be defined by your upbringing, by your sin, by your mistakes in a moment of de desperation. Jesus gives you a new identity, a new definition. He tells you who you are. The old has passed away, the new has come. So don't be a foil, right? Be a tool for God's use in this world. Last one that I have for you then is kill it while it's a root. Kill it while it's a root. Don't let it take effect, right? Don't let it keep you bitter. Don't dwell on it, whatever that mistake was, whatever that, uh, that terrible thing that is, is, a, is a part of your past. Again, that passage in Hebrews 12, see to it that no one fa fails to obtain the grace of God. God is there to give grace, right? That no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it, many become defiled. Okay, I, I don't know if Esau saw himself as significant in the world around him, but his, um, his legacy lasts at least 2,000 years, down to Herod the Great, as, as he's called by history. Not great in any way, except that he built great buildings. Right? This, his legacy lasts for 2,000 years, has impact all the way down to that. Don't let your root of bitterness in your own generation have that kind of effect on the next one. Turn from it, repent, Pull from God's grace and then go forward from there. That's what I have for you this morning. There are some discussion questions in your notes there. I'm going to turn it over to your tables for discussion. But before I do, I want to pray with you. Dearest Lord God, I thank you for the fellowship that we enjoy at, at this place at this time. Lord, I know that all over the world there are people who long for the kind of fellowship that we have here in this room this morning. So Lord, I pray that you would give us the eyes and the ears to hear what you have us to hear from other brothers Lord, I pray that we would um, have an appreciation of the grace that you've given to us, to the, that we can dwell with one another. Lord, I pray that if there are places even around these tables where there needs to be forgiveness uh, so that a root of bitterness wouldn't come up, Lord, I pray that you would grant that. Lord, if there needs to be repentance in our own lives, if you can help us to remember those things that have defined us that should not, Lord, I pray that we would repent of those things and we would turn to you and, and realize that our de dependence, that our identity is built on you alone. Lord, I thank you for your grace and mercy. You are indeed gracious and merciful, abounding in steadfast love and relenting of disaster. And so, Lord, we have seen that in our own lives. We've heard it in the testimonies even given today. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to be agents of your grace to others as well, that we would stop the root of bitterness in our own day and in our own generation, that it might not impact others down further from us. Lord, I thank you that we don't have to be a foil, nor that we get to be used by you for eternity, that our names are written in the book of life. And that gives us hope, and that gives us peace, and that gives us endurance in this life. Lord, I thank you for those who've gone before us, who've been faithful to hand it down to us. And I would pray that we would follow their example and hand down to the next generation what you've given to us as well. In Jesus' name, amen.